all of the initial launch hype and hubbub about the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K was going on, I admit I was a tad bit skeptical, even though I was someone who's primarily shot Micro Four Thirds for the past couple years now, I was ready to move on. I decided that it seemed like the entire market was moving away from Micro Four Thirds and small sensors to trying to shove everything they can in full frame. I still kind of wanted to be convinced. And thankfully, the good people at Blackmagic Design wanted to send me out a loaner of the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K for me to check out for myself. And I am fairly blown away, if I'm honest. This camera packs some of the best value you can get period for 1300 bucks beats out pretty much every offering from Sony and Panasonic if you're into cinema cameras and not like vlogging or something like that which we'll touch on in a bit. I also wanted to give a huge shout out to lensprotogo.com as well as lensrentals.com for hooking me up with this wooden camera cage system for the camera and some lens rentals for me to check out during the time with this review. Go check them out with the link in the description below. They have high quality lenses and they ship them in Pelican cases so that they stay safe and you can travel with them on your shoots and things like that. They are pretty solid. So let's talk about the specs of this camera for a moment. You're looking at a 4 thirds size sensor measuring 18.96 millimeters by 10 millimeters with 13 stops, that was three, of dynamic range and a dual native ISO at 400 and 3200 which can extend up to 25,600. But it is still a small sensor camera so low light expectations should be tailored accordingly. The camera features a normal SD UHS 2 slot and a CFast 2.0 slot and USB-C SSD recording capability. I opted for the USB-C SSD option and a SD card because CFast 2.0 cards are just highway robbery price-wise IMO. The camera can shoot Blackmagic RAW and ProRes at DCI 4K or UHD 4K up to 60 frames per second and 1080p up to 120 frames per second if you don't mind a massive crop or window as they call it on the sensor. Unfortunately, no full sensor readout at 1080p 120 frames per second. The camera has a standard Micro Four Thirds lens mount, which can be adapted via a speed booster. I've been messing around with Viltrox's 0.71x EF mount adapter myself, and it has full HDMI, si you know, full size HDMI out, a mini XLR, and 3.5 millimeter inputs, both for audio, headphone jack, and Bluetooth connectivity. There's a dual built-in microphones for scratch audio. They don't sound terrible, but especially being right where the hand grips, I'm not sure I'd ever recommend them for actual like real audio use just for getting the required onset audio to sync things up. This is a microphone test using the 3.5 millimeter input using the Movo. It is a knockoff of one of the Rode Video Micro microphones. Ran into the 3.5 millimeter port. This is a microphone test in my usual stand-up studio setup. And this is a test using the XLR input with my Deity S Mic 2 ran in by a mini XLR adapter. Again, phantom power applied in my normal recording space. This is a microphone test. So while yes, this is a Micro Four Thirds camera, the fact that you get direct RAW and now within the time period of me reviewing this camera, Black Magic RAW with it, which is way better, and ProRes, you can inherently get better video as long as you don't need continuous autofocus or stabilization out of this camera than you can any camera competing at the price point or at this sensor size, pretty much period, unless you're getting a really good deal on some very old <laughs> RAW cinema cameras, which I don't even know of any that are this cheap. As far as ergonomics goes, it's not the best, but it's pretty good. It's got a very substantial hand grip here, and I even made fun of it at the first NAB this was shown at because it looked like a body straight out of like the 70s or something as far as cameras go. But it actually holds up really well. They moved to more lighter and lighter plastic, so it's one of the lighter cameras that you can get aside from adding everything else to it to keep it stable. And that's part of the problem is there is no image stabilization although you can get uh, in lens, you can get stabilized lens of lenses, of course, uh, and there is no continuous autofocus, which for a cinema camera, for the purposes of this, it's not a huge deal, but I do find myself missing it from time to time, especially given that it is a smaller form factor and you'd expect it. But if you get it rigged up with a cage like this, you can get a little bit more stable shots. But the rig ability, while far removing this camera from fitting in your pocket, is a very strong point for it. The whole camera is built with ergonomics and rigging in mind. I.O. on the same side, ready to be mounted out of the way, though I find the covering flaps an absolute nightmare to get out of my way when running multiple cables, and you can buy cages or cage add-ons to secure the HDMI, like shown here, as well as secure the USB-C port and lock your SSD into place to prevent it from being ripped off, which can happen. 
This in particular does not come with or did not come with a wooden camera mount that I have, but they do sell those individually that can just tap into your existing camera cage. There are quarter 20 th taps on both the top and bottom of the camera. This means that there is no shoe mount, but you can just add your own and it helps secure the camera into cages like this wooden camera one here. Then you can add microphones, monitors, whatever you need. The cage also help keeps, helps keep it more stable while shooting handheld, though it's still not great. This is something you can clean up via post-production stabilization in a lot of cases, though admittedly, I really suck at this process and don't mess with warp stabilization much at all myself, but I know plenty of people who can get away with it. Now, my cage setup is quite simple. If you look at someone like Brandon Lees from Linus Media Group, his build out for this camera is insane. There's a lot you can do with it. The ergonomics also come in the form of buttons and control layouts. You have three custom function buttons you can set to whatever you want, false color, focus peaking, zebras, LUTs, things like that, as well as dedicated buttons for white balance, ISO, shutter speed, and a handy click dial so that you never need to actually touch the screen to adjust those settings if you don't want to or it's blocked by a battery or something. Dedicated buttons for photos, for the stills, and for recording are where you'd expect, but there's also a second record button up closer to the lens mount, although this one is a bit tough to hit. Back by the screen, you have buttons for iris and autofocusing, though it's a one-time thing, not a continuous autofocus, as well as high frame rate toggles, punch in for focus checking, menu and playback buttons, things like that. Do keep in mind that the playback will only playback footage shot in the mode that you're currently in. This is quite annoying but it seems to be the standard with Blackmagic cameras. There's even a freaking tally light on the front to indicate when you're recording. This has come in quite in handy for myself quite a few times now. And it is a smaller sensor, so it's not gonna have amazing low light performance, but the low light performance is pretty competitive compared to the Panasonic cameras I've been using for a couple of years. And it even uh, sort of catches up a bit with my Ursa Mini Pro, which is my full-fledged cinema camera from Blackmagic. However, they are not the same sensor. I've seen a lot of reviews of implying that this is the same sensor, just smaller somehow. It's not at all. The way it interacts with noise is different and things like that. It is still pretty nice. When you're working in pseudo low light around ISO 800 or 1000 or so in raw mode, things can start to get really noisy. You can see for sure, but things start to get noisy. Thankfully, Resolve's noise reduction tools are freaking phenomenal and you can clean up a lot of that quite easily. The screen on the back is absolutely beautiful. It is super bright, super crisp, super clear, and you get the nice touchscreen interface with that same super intuitive operating system that is run on my Ursa Mini Pro, which I am a huge fan of. Every setting is where you think it would be. It's within a couple touches of your fingertips or the programmable buttons. It is super great, but the screen doesn't flip out. That is the trade-off. Getting this, this high quality of a screen and this big of a screen means that it's not gonna go anywhere and I do miss that from time to time. I personally have not figured out the workflow of working with monitors. I just can't make it work for me. I have a couple, I use them for self-shooting sometimes for seeing myself, but if I'm shooting product shots or shooting other shots, I can't make a monitor work for me personally. It just, I haven't figured it out. And so not being able to move the screen even just slightly off to the left when I'm on the side of the camera is a tad annoying. An issue I did run into with the on-screen display and what it can output via HDMI is there is no waveform monitor. You just get a basic histogram, no waveform, no vector scopes, things like that. Admittedly, I'm not super advanced in my experience using a lot of these on-screen feedback and display things just yet. I'm still learning. However, I do find the waveform to be extremely useful. Obviously, I can still use a histogram and that works. But for something that has so much flex flexibility and customizability, I might have expected a waveform option to be present. And you can neither show it on the on-camera on on display nor on the HDMI out. The same is true of my Ursa Mini Pro as well. Now, of course, you can use a third-party monitor to show this. And I used a little EOYO 7-inch. I do realize I mentioned that I can't make it work for me. It's not ideal to use a monitor in my standard studio B-roll shooting environment compared to... A, an on-screen flip-out display, um, but I can use one from time to time, and you can get that functionality back with a proper studio monitor, but I did find it a little annoying because the customization that you can do of what you send to HDMI or to the LCD monitor and which, you know, which ones you go to both, you can customize whatever you want to go to each. So LUTs, false color, zebras, focus peaking, 
clean display feed. You can customize which one gets what, so I, you can either use it as a full-fledged monitor like I do, or you can send a completely untouched feed out to a recorder like my Atomos Ninja Inferno and have the best of both worlds. It's really cool. I just wish they had a, a waveform. One other annoyance that I really ran into was the power system. And I know a lot of people have complained about this, but I've seen a lot of people defending it. This has the most abysmal battery life out of any camera I have ever used in my entire life. I had, I had ended up purchasing like eight more LPE6 Canon batteries for this camera because it just eats through them within like 30 minutes of at all use, not just recording, just power on use. And if you leave them in the camera overnight, when you turn the camera back on, it's going to say that the battery is dead for some reason. Don't know what's going on with that. Now, I do use a lot of generic batteries and that can affect this. However, it is absolutely abysmal. Now, it does come with the little 12 volt three pin power supply here. However, I have not found any easy alternatives for hooking that up. Not only do you, can you not operate the camera while it's plugged in, it's charging the batteries, you don't get any indication that the batteries are charging at all or what that status is or anything like that. And trying to find extra cables to convert to something else, like to adapt to DTAP or anything like that, they're like 40 or 50 bucks for something that is just a couple wires and an end. But even to just find an end that I can cut off myself and solder, solder, I haven't found one that I could justify buying the cost for a two-week loaner. It's kind of ridiculous. And you can't charge and run it over USB while using it either. Or, I mean, you can, but you, use, you lose the USB recording, which is kind of important. For that USB recording, I no longer have it in my pocket here. I've been using a SanDisk portable SSD via USB-C. Works phenomenally. I don't even know if it's on their list. They have a whole compatibility list of SSDs that work with it. I highly recommend checking that out. Usually the Samsung T5 is recommended, but my buddies over at Zcam for the Zcam E2 have run into issues with it. So I picked up the SanDisk one that they recommended for being a lot more stable. And you get, depending on your RAW or ProRes setting, you can get up to two hours of shooting out of that of a one terabyte SSD. You can go full 4K, 60P, 1080P, 120P, uh, all through here at full RAW or Blackmagic RAW or ProRes settings. So I was quite impressed. I did. However, catch a bug in the latest Blackmagic Camera 6.2 update for this camera. It added Blackmagic RAW, but stills are still shot in DNG, of course, because that's a photo format. After this update, stills saved to my USB-C SSD do not save properly. Normally, when you take a still, the record time indicator that says how much time is remaining will say still while it writes the still file, and then you're good. With my USB-C SSD plugged in with this firmware update, that doesn't happen, and stills are saved as zero bytes, and they're just not there. I shot a lot of stills on the trip where I was, you know, getting the IRL footage for this camera. Thankfully, just of stuff I was already shooting video of at least, but it was still quite disappointing to see that they were missing. If you just have a SD card in, or presumably a CFast card, but I don't have one to test that with, you, it will say fine, fine to that. As far as I can tell, it just writes it to that normally, but as soon as you plug in the SSD, it doesn't update it. As far as I can tell, this was not an issue with the original 5.2 firmware that this camera shipped to me with, so I have reported the issue to Blackmagic, and hopefully it's fixed in the latest camera update whenever they put it out. An alternative that I would like to see added here is the ability to tell it to write stills to the SD card and write video to the SSD or something like that. But as is, if you plug in an SSD, it only reads, I guess because that's the two fastest options, it only reads the CFast slot and the SD or the SSD via USB-C. Even if you don't have a CFast card in, it doesn't let you ha like interact between the SD card and the SSD, only CFast and SSD. It's really annoying. Let's talk about the software side for a moment. This camera costs $1,300, but comes with a full license for the studio version of DaVinci Resolve inside, with two activations. That alone is a $300 value, and well worth learning and using, at least for your color grading. I've been documenting my progress learning and using Resolve on the channel, and I love the node-based color workflow and things like that, even though I'm still definitely a beginner at this point. I've used this software for almost 50 video edits, full video edits as well, though I keep running into issues with audio in it, particularly from OBS Studio and other H.264 sources, so I've switched back to just grading in Resolve for now and editing in Premiere for most of my videos, though this review is edited in Resolve. But don't sleep on the software. Also, the inclusion of Blackmagic RAW on this camera is an insane value. I was originally going to be quite critical of BMD for not including it at launch, as 
that this would have been the perfect showcase for what black magic rock can do in the palm of your hands but it was already released while I was working on this video. You can use this to get full 4K60 RAW written to SD cards, packaged up in a single file and smaller than both Cinema DNG RAW and ProRes. This is huge. I've used both DNG RAW and Blackmagic RAW, and if nothing else, the file transfer speed advantage of having one big file that can efficiently transfer quickly to my NAS versus a bunch of little files, which always goes slower, is a lifesaver. I've used ProRes quite a bit on both this camera and my Ursa Mini Pro, but I prefer to stick to B-RAW. This camera also can only shoot ProRes in 422 modes, which is still great, but not the full 4444XQ that the Ursa has. So if you want full color space, you want RAW anyway. Blackmagic RAW also supports full CPU and GPU acceleration on the timeline, and it's very blazing fast to use. However, if you don't want to use Resolve at all, there is a $30 plugin for Premiere, which allows support for it, but I do hope Adobe implements it natively, especially since Blackmagic is making it free to do so. However, they don't even support Cinema DNG RAW natively, so what the hell, Adobe? I was also disappointed that there is no proper 4x3 anamor anamorphic de-squeeze mode in this camera like my Ursa Mini Pro. I understand why, but I was still bummed. I still used this opportunity to test out the SLR Magic Anamorphot 35mm T 2.4 lens and have some fun with it, but running at the full DCI 4K, this stretches out to a full 8K wide image, which is comically wide, but the results can be quite beautiful. Admittedly, I'm not the biggest fan of this specific lens on the whole, but it was still fun to try out for the first time and get some pretty cool results. Overall, I have some super big complaints about some functionality about this, but regardless of that, if you're looking into Micro Four Thirds cameras or mirrorless cameras in general and not going full frame and you want a camera for around 1300 bucks, if you're not doing vlogging or something where you need stabilization, pointing it at yourself, autofocus, anything like that, I genuinely can't see an argument for buying any other camera other than this, unless your workflow is specifically uploading straight off the SD card to whatever your delivery source is. Because ProRes or RAW, you get phenomenally higher image quality and way more control over your image with every aspect of this camera. And that's pretty crazy. I look forward to what they do with Gen 2, because they've already just announced a Gen 2 of my Ursa Mini Pro, uh, which has improved a lot of things. So I imagine Gen 2 of this will be pretty flawless. And yeah, thanks to Blackmagic for sending a loaner out for this for review. And again, thank you to Lens, Pro, Lens Pro to Go. I'm always going to say this wrong. Lens Pro to Go and LensRentals.com for letting me borrow some lenses and this wooden camera cage so I could really put this to the test. Links to them will be in the description below. As always, hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe for more tech education. Uh, check out, we've got Patreons and Reddits and Discord servers, everything now. Links in the description. I'll see you in the next one.